So it has the this is the open global mind call on Thursday, January 26th, 2023. Um, Judy, like much snow on the ground in Minneapolis, or what's the what's the sitch? <laughs> The actual snow on the ground is probably only five inches at this point because there's been some sun melt, but I have a drift that's over six feet tall across the street from my driveway where they plowed all of the snow when we got the 20 inch snowfall. And nice. so that's pretty interesting. The neighborhood streets are pretty snow packed because they got driven on before they were plowed and they had to work to uncover mailboxes because they were kind of covered up once the plow went through. Yeah, so yeah. It's, been, it's been interesting. <laughs> um, it's making me want to not be in Minnesota between December and March. <laughs> that I hate to leave a house alone for that same reason, because I just worry about what could happen. Yeah. And all over the houses, everything has icicles on them, because even if you've got good insulation, the sun melt creates just enough mm -hmm. to get icicles. And so they're kind of like, three feet long and four inches thick at times but luckily nobody would ever come close to my house so i'm not worried about anybody getting killed or something but it's there's, it's kind of bizarre there's daggers judy, everywhere how, judy how typical or extreme is this winter compared to others actually it's the warmest winter in 80 years wow. um, for the first we haven't really had very many days when the high was below zero i think the first one was last week and usually in Minnesota, we get these clear days where it's really sunny and it just gets down to the high is zero and the low is 20 something below or somewhere. Um, we've ne I don't remember ever having this big a single so snowfall, the, the 20 inch plus total snow in one storm is very unusual. We more typically get, we think it's a big snow if it's eight to 10 or eight to 12. Mm -hmm. um, Yep. And so that's not common. And I, I suspect it all has to do with the changing weather patterns. You could see this one coming from the West Coast. You can see all the water in California. I mean, it's just, we're getting more ocean evaporation and then redeposited in different forms. It's the atmospheric rivers and arc storms and things like that. Um, and before what you were just saying, Judy, I'd never thought of the dilemma of mail carriers during or after blizzards. And I'd never thought about, oh, wait a minute, everybody's having trouble shoveling out and even you know, like walking outside. How does anybody get them? How do you know, how does the post office make it around? Most of the well, in Minnesota now, <laughs> all of the mail delivery is actually curbside so they can do it from a truck. So nobody right. comes to the door unless you have a parcel. And they, and I try to keep things my, my, my homeowners association does a pretty decent job of plowing. Um, but I have to get out there for and put salt on the stoop because the ice icicle melt on the front porch makes the front steps kind of icy. There's a couple steps up to the door of the, the house. So it's it's been, it is interesting. I mean, I grew up in Illinois, so I'm kind of used to the whole thing. And in the old days, people never had house delivery. It was always a mailbox in the curve. So it's kind of like they're going back to realizing that's more efficient for the mail service although perhaps less con convenient for homeowners. But I, I don't know, I think walking 50 feet to your front street to get your mail is a reasonable exercise demand to put on humans at this point. Yeah, we're exactly. So We're so sedimentary. <clears throat> um, also, houses used to have coal chutes and milk boxes by the door for home delivery of said things. Right. <clears throat> So maybe we need like drone delivery of physical mail. Although all the physical mail that I mostly get now is flyers that I wish. Is there any way to have a class action suit to stop those flyers all from those happening? third class stuff? Yeah, I just put all of it in the trash on my way through the garage. <laughs> it, go, it goes from my mailbox directly into the trash with regret every time. Yeah, <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I hate and I hate the stores that create that much paper and ship it around. <laughs> it's like it's it's and it's so inefficient now because the. The population is so accustomed to not actually reading anything that's physical anyhow. Right. It's a, it's kind of a stupid thing to do, but they all seem to still want to do it. They want to give you coupons or things to try to get you to come in. Well, the, story, the story I'd read is that um, Kmart, I think, tried to stop their flyers. They experimented with stopping the flyers, and it turned out that people stopped showing up in the stores. Mm. Like, like, I don't mean everybody, but but sales definitely fell off. 
and they they were sort of forced to go back into the direct mail business of getting those things out and that's depressing well it's the, the sort of false advertising is an, another whole topic we could talk about sometime in terms of what's really a bargain compared to what's out there in very available pricing and exactly it's, just, it's kind of nuts but anyway but at least it's today it's a bright sunny day so it's actually really pretty in minnesota it's the classic winter day when the sun is out and you almost need sunglasses because of the glare off the snow <laughs> Love that. Um, welcome to the call, everybody. Uh, I put a topic on the call of um, what is truth and what are values uh, prompted by Bentley, who then subsequently overnight put a different message after that in the Mattermost and said, oh, um, by the way, <clears throat> we tried this in the Canonic Debate Lab and the debate didn't go all that well. So I'm not sure. It's, it seems like it's sort of maybe a dead end. And I'm like, oh, uh oh. And then I thought, there are some really interesting ways that we might be able to handle this conversation. And Bentley's on this call. Yay. <clears throat> nice to see you. Hi, Klaus. Thanks for joining. But I think that there's lots of interesting ways we could go uh, go into this. Um, I'm also happy to entertain motions to, to switch the topic entirely. Um, but I wanted to dive in for one second into, um, into the topic, <clears throat> just for, for a couple sort of light reasons, and then see where it goes. Um, in the chat, we're talking about direct mail for a bit. The neighborhood where I am in Portland used to be a really heavy direct mail hub, and there's a large postal center um, that is being torn down. And it, 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 and its remaking is probably going to reshape my whole neighborhood, but I have no idea what the plan is to do it. But I've watched as uh, one after the other little old printing houses, printing shops, and then like junk mail, mass mail creators, packagers, and then shippers closed down and got turned into five plus one condo uh, units or apartment units in the neighborhood just all over the place and it's a it's been a transformation just uh, we've been here in, since 2015 and it's been quite a transformation in the hood <clears throat> seeing an industry basically vanish uh, and be replaced with flats um, so let me read <clears throat> from the etymology online from the online etymology dictionary, let me read the, uh, actually, I'm not gonna read some of the definition from, of truth. I'll post the, the link in the Zoom chat. Um, but what I wanna do is, is um, Doug had sent us a link talking about trough and sort of trust between people. Um, that doesn't show up that much in this particular etymology, but it does link back to deru, which is, so, uh, and this is kind of a proto-Indo-European root, meaning to be firm, solid, and steadfast with specialized senses of wood or tree or derivatives referring to objects made of wood. <laughs> and that seemed really interesting to me as a place. Um, and then at, at the beginning of, the, of it, it says it's West Saxon from Trivo uh, or Mercian, faith, faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, veracity, quality of being true, pledge, covenant. <laughs> and to me, Faith, fidelity, and loyalty are different from a scientific truth in notable and interesting ways. Um, and so I thought I would drop those things in uh, in the conversation. And also, I checked in <clears throat> Raymond Williams' wonderful book, Keywords, and he does not define, he does not do the etymology or origins of truth or values. Neither word is, is actually in keywords, which was interesting. Um, uh, Bentley, I don't know if you can talk uh, from where you're calling in, but if you want to jump in, uh, you're listening while multi multitasking, I just noticed in the chat, so never mind. Um, whoever would like to add in, please uh, jump in. I just wanted to toss in that in my mind, my family didn't really talk about truth, but they talked, and they didn't use this word when we were kids, but discernment, the kind of does that make sense to you question. and the, the exploration of information at all times. And that's another dimension, I think, of the topic, different from the discrete one you proposed, but one that if we don't do today, I'd love to do some other time. Well, I'd like to find our way to things like discernment like right away, um, because I think that that's a very interesting journey for us. Uh, Gil. So um, discernment brings us right to the question of absolute versus subjective truth which is part of what this conversation is. And uh, one of the things I've been observing a lot lately is the difference between 
I'm going to I'm going to walk off the plank here between physics, truth, and human truth. Uh, you know, we we all live in interpretation. We can't do other than that. There's no ultimate truth in human experience, much less understanding somebody else's experience. But I I'm I'm pretty certain that if I hold up the computer and drop it, it's going to fall because gravity is the law, right? right. Uh, you know, uh, physics is telling us it actually is not that clear. So, uh, you know, it may be it may be turtles all the way down. Uh, I'm wondering two things. One is what was Plato's definition of truth, if somebody's got that at hand. Uh, and I'd like to know from Ken what's troublesome about the word for you. Ken, you want to jump in now and then I'll go to Mark? Sure. As... Um... As my friend Robert Gilman uh, says, he's a, he's a re astrophysicist. He says, in science, we believe all truth is partial, subjective, uh, excuse, partial, selective, and provisional, because we always know that we're going to discover more things. So it's it's partial because we can only see part of things. So the human experience is bounded by our senses and our thinking, and it's the universe is vast and we are tiny. So we just see what we think and we and we make up shit about it and we test it to see if it's true. So it's it's partial. It's selective because we select out what we're capable of working with. And it's provisional because as we go on and learn more things, our uh, truth is going to change. And so from a scientific standpoint, that makes a lot of sense to me. Then you couple that with people who have uh, religious proclivities and say there is just one truth. And Picasso said if there were only one truth, you couldn't paint a hundred canvases on the same topic which I really love. Uh, and they couple that with righteousness and start to tell you how to live your life. And it's like, go away really fast, really far. So I find truth, capital T truth. Uh, there's small T truths. And I think it was Heisenberg who said the opposite of a truth is a lie, but the opposite of a great truth is another great truth. So a few things about truth from my little trove of truth in my brain, the, this brain. That was a very nice uh, excursion through your trove of truth. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Carranza. I want to make a recommendation. I just posted in the chat um, the archive.org link to um, Jacob Bronowski's 1974 series, uh, The Ascent of Man. And uh, chapter 11, Knowledge or Certainty, is a most excellent video essay on this very topic. And it's in completely clear, beautiful, and powerful. Um, one of the incredible examples of how to communicate um, on this very topic. Um, and the ending is just heart-rending. Um, uh, there is a notion called fallibilism uh, from the American philosopher um, Charles Sanders Peirce, and fallibilism is uh, well um, defined in Wikipedia. Um, basically, all knowledge is, all, all scientific knowledge is provisional. Um, science never proves anything. Um, and um, those who say that we have certain knowledge are trying to manipulate you emotionally um, because of uh, I have just this desire for certainty and um, a fear of uncertainty. That's it. Thanks. Um, I highly recommend checking out that video and Thank sharing you. it with uh, um, high school students, um, maybe even junior high school students. So that's kind of powerful. Thanks. I think one of my ancient regrets that you've just dug up out of the, the depths of memory is not having watched The Ascent of Man. Um, which is interesting. And then I'd love maybe to watch it now, given what else I've learned about history and other interpretations and so forth, like the dawn of everything, uh, book club and, and, and whatnot, to see how, it, how, how all these things hold up and, you know, which direction this all went in. Um, so so I, I've always been leery of capital T truth. I, I, I've always said when somebody shows up and tells you they know the truth with a big T, uh, your little alarm bells probably ought to start sounding. Um, and as Gil said, there's a few things that we can count on uh, predictably uh, that operate within certain realms and regimes like the laws of physics and such, but the predictability of chemical reactions and physics and, and so forth. But, but in general, it's like, beware of truth and beware of people that make you pledge to a particular set of truths 
um, as the membership criteria for a thing, whether it's a religion or, or something else. <clears throat> I think that's Rob getting a call because his, his icon's like lighting up on my screen. Um, and then as Eric posts, posts in the chat, uh, chat GPT is now creating new truths for us with uh, squishy, uh, squishy air quotes around the word truths there probably. Um, but in some cases, um, let me take one particular <clears throat> uh, path away from this topic, uh, it, which is um, we seem to be in an era where arguing over what is true, even in a soft lowercase sense, is a big deal of what's going on, that the undermining of facts, uh, the undermining of trust, the undermining of uh, science, journalism, what have you, uh, is, is a, 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 from my perspective, uh, a weapon, a weapon of choice in the political uh, and geo-emotional battles that we're going through. Um, and so in some sense, there's this weaponization of truth and trust that's going on. Uh, Stacey. Rick asked an interesting question in the chat, and I'm wondering if he wants to talk more about it or has an answer. Are you still there? He just went off camera, though. He is Which back. <laughs> Which... <laughs> um, how, I, how might we use discernment to seek the different domains of truth? Yeah, I, I sort of echo what uh, Jerry was talking about, truth with a small t. I mean, there are a few truths, as far as we can tell. Death, we could you know, say, well, maybe that is an absolute truth. You're gone. <laughs> if we get something out of it, you know, so we can quibble over things like that. So, um, and, um, you know, I think it's worthwhile delineating the different domains, because if you go, if you're predominantly trained in one domain, you go to a different domain and use your mindset from that domain to seek truth in a different domain, then you can run into problems. So I, I, I asked the question open-endedly. I'm not proposing that one has an answer, because after all, we're seeking truth together. And Rick, can you start with like domain? Well, you said domains of truth. What do you mean? Can you give some examples of different domains of truth? Well, I mean, you can talk about, uh, you know, the physical world. Uh, you could talk about the scientific world. You could talk about the natural world. You could talk about the psychological world. You could talk about the philosophical world. You could talk about the religious world. I mean, you can have a plethora of different domains that you may have you've been trained in a certain way to look at things. So as a physician, I've been trained in a certain scientific way. Although I, 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 I've always been a bit of a renegade because I thought it's, it's a very limited perspective, uh, you know, particularly if you're taking a reductionist perspective uh, to truth seeking, uh, which uh, a lot of medicine tends to focus into. So if you don't understand your mindset when you're starting the discernment, then uh, you're going to be limited in understanding different peoples of how they seek truth and how they see it. And to me, that's where the richness of the dialogue comes in, is where we're clear about uh, where we're coming from, the assumptions we're making about truth seeking, and in which domains we're working in. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Back, back to Stacey and then to Mark. Go ahead, Stacey. No, I was just going to say it's that last part of what he said that I'm really interested in because what I notice is that when people are disagreeing, it's because they're focused on a different domain. And the problem is when we try to communicate with them, we're staying in our domain, which isn't gonna work because that's why we're not in the same place to start with. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe sometimes we need a clarification of domains between speaking parties so that we can sort some of that out. Would that help? I would just also add different methods of discernment as well. Mm -hmm. So that they, you know, they go hand in hand. And if you don't have clarity over that, uh, you know, that's where some of the, that's why it's so difficult to find middle ground. If you can work to some middle ground and appreciate different perspectives, you might be able to find something. I'm not, I'm not so enamored with the idea of common ground. Thanks, Rick. Go ahead, Mark. I just wanted to observe as a scientist that Truth is the best approximation today. <laughs> it's, it's not ever absolute. There's very little that scientists would say is true. They would just say that our best understanding is X <laughs> and mm -hmm. here's a good model. Um, but I think decoupling it from the idea that there, 
there is absolute truth when it's a perception of humans is a complicated thing to try to do. Absolutely. Go ahead, Mark. You're, you're remuted though. I had a very interesting experience. Um, uh, I am so lucky to be uh, in love with a wonderful woman. Um, and uh, we we're having a conversation where she says, um, you know, kind of, she's very skeptical. Um, and uh, oddly enough, a huge fan of, uh, of objectivism and uh, Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand. Ayn, Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, yes. Um, which is just like, you know. <laughs> now what have you done? A complete challenge, exactly. Now what have I done? Um, but I, I encourage her to stand up for her, her, uh, her beliefs and her, her, you know, what she, what she knows and to, to test that. Um, anyway, she said, um, you know, she's kind of doubting her feelings um, because, you know, love is um, a hormonal oxytocin thing. Ayn and Rand is not the best role model for a romantic relationship. I will just add that. I, I think I have some uncertainty related to this. Yes. <laughs> Just saying the history on that's not great. I I completely <laughs> uh completely agree um to, with my level of tolerance uh, to uh uncertainty. Um but um I kind of took that oh, you, you know love is explained by oxytocin and kind of like uh uh you know this is a little bit oh yeah this is one of my favorite comics. Lovely. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Ken Homer uh, turned me on to that. Um, not sure. Anyway. Um, so we got into a little discussion about, you know, there's a difference between, you know, description, you know, that, you know, oxytocin has, you know, kind of a effect on emotional, human emotional feeling and, and feeling closeness and the difference between how and why. Um, description as opposed to um, uh, explanation and you know basically um, oxytocin does not explain love um, and uh, you know it has a you know, there's a component there there's an interesting you know kind of influence there but um, love is much more um, difficult to find what the truth is when how love is created um yeah exactly it doesn't explain it at all um or you know there's only you know a little uh kind of uh explanation anyway uh, enough about that um i'll go on to bentley unless there's a comment um bentley thanks for thanks for joining jump in hey so um I did want to just kind of some things came to mind while listening to the conversation. Um, one is so one of the problems is when people talk about like defining truth is that, and we talked about dimensions, that I think that if you take all the different ways people use that word and you mapped it on any the set of dimensions that, of, the, of the concepts that they're pointing to and you drew a Venn diagram, I think some of those circles would not overlap. So the problem is the word in its current use is not definable. There's no definition that could cover all the uses of the word truth. And so the reason that this kind of came up is when we're doing debates and we're talking about truth, we needed a narrower definition. And I didn't even want it to include subjective truths because there's not much point in debating about that. Um, so I, what I was kind of hoping to do is kind of have a map of how people are using the word truth and then, you know, a way for people to point to, well, this is what I'm talking about, because the ambiguity of that word is kind of one of the problems in communication. It's not that people are a lot of times not even really disagreeing, they're just miscommunicating. So when someone says it is true that, and I don't think many people, if you actually like tied them down to a table that 
they wouldn't admit that there's a that they're only at 99.9 percent .9 certainty i mean there's a chance that we're in a matrix by aliens right so anything we see could be untrue so no one no one in their heart of hearts really believes i mean they'll say there's an absolute truth but no one actually um when it comes to brass tacks i don't think very many people um actually believe that any of their truths are at 100 percent and that's also kind of a pro one of the problems with science communication is that when we say that this is it's not normal to put confidence bars on that if there's been one study that hasn't been replicated 51 percent confident if if it's the theory that's been proved out by thousands of studies then it's 99.99 it'd be nice to have that is part of the communication so maybe maybe the word we should be looking for is certainty rather than truth some thoughts thanks bentley uh, mark um there's a um wonderful term in art of uh linguistic art um called umbrella term or umbrella word um where you know if you're looking for you know explanations of intelligence or testing intelligence you know you're not going to find it only in a iq test um so intelligence like love like truth um is an umbrella term it covers many different things and using that one word for everything is just um uh you know leading to reflexive miscommunication Um, and Gil asked in the chat, so what does this have to do with, with OGM and, and Gil, I think that, I think that, um, no, I didn't ask that Jerry, or, but, but it's sort of like that. I asked why, why are we so concerned with this topic? Why do we ah. care? Why do we care about truth? And I think what, um, um, someone just said about certainty is a clue to that, which is that we need enough certainty to be able to act, to, to make decisions, to do things on our own and particular to do things with other people so to coordinate with other people we need some agreement on relative certainty or enough certainty to say yes i will commit to do this with you or i won't uh, so the certainty is i would argue always relative or subjective it's always based on interpretation but we try to find some degree of convergence so that we can act in the world uh, so that's one possible explanation but I, but i i want to return to the question it's like you know this this matters a lot to people. I mean, you see it in this conversation in a common, relaxed way, but under the surface, this, you know, I I I feel that what we're talking about matters to people. Uh, out in the world, as Ken and I were just exchanging in the chat, you know, people kill each other over this shit. You know, so clearly it matters a lot. And other people I, I, have a much more relativistic <clears throat> and you know, flowy view about it. It doesn't matter so much, but you know. Can we say everybody's got a point at which they break or or stand firm or will not accept or, you know, whatever? Uh, so I think there's something in that territory, and it maybe is not as much of a philosophical question as a different kind of question. I don't know what to label it, but it's something, maybe something different. Um, I want to put a puzzle I've been chewing on a tiny bit in the conversation, which is humans seem to love predictability and routine and humans seem to love novelty mm -hmm. mm. and those two things are seem a bit contradictory and I'm unclear how they actually play together um so I'm trying I've been sort of chucking them together in my head but 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 in on the one hand part of the reason why we seize truths and and some kind of of uh approach that like you've just been describing Gil is that it's predictable some some it's it's certain it's certain because a billion people said so too so a billion people can't be wrong, right? That's a whole lot of people to be really wrong. Um, and so we love the certainty. We want the certainty. And yet we get bored with stuff. We seek novelty. Novelty seeking is a, is a genuine, it's the reason that TikTok videos and Instagram reels and YouTube shorts are so appealing. It's like flip, 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 flip. That like the, the infinite scroll, doom scrolling, all those things are humans addiction to the, the quest for novelty. And we're, we're big on that. <clears throat> and so maybe there's gradations like we like novelty but not so much in things that affect my life so profoundly don't know but I don't know where that boundary lies um and and I think that our our quest to hold on to truths with fervor 
is often this goal of trying to create consistency or predictability um, in some sense. Uh, Klaus, then Mike. Yeah, this is one reason why I like theory U so much. <clears throat> Your theory U never mentions the word truth, but the the going in assumption for any social systems change uh, uh, project is that we just don't know enough about the issue. So they're starting when you look at the entry part of the U, they're starting out with the iceberg model. And so the first the first encouragement is. Here's a question. You no, know, we all have assumptions about this particular point, but let's just dig in and look up below the waterline and see what's down there. And then you reach a point of presencing, which is again not necessarily truth, but it is a it is a, an aligned opinion about this phenomena that we're dealing with, which allows us now to move forward towards finding solutions on how to act upon it, right? Going into prototyping i'm going into crystallizing and prototyping and then uh, developing this so so the the if we could step back from the idea of truth and simply look at best available information that needs further amplification uh, that is uh, in my mind you know, the most productive way within a team you know, because we don't need to argue we just need more information and and share the information Thank you. Um, somebody's device is making a, a bunch of funny noises, and I'm not exactly sure who's it is. All right. Oh, good. Um, thanks. Go ahead, Mike. Um, sorry to join late. I'm really disappointed that I couldn't be here at the start, but um, I love the topic. Um, I particularly like the focus on values because in my world of digital policy, there's a lot of discussion at the international level about the need for policies that reflect our shared values or our common values or our democratic values. The Europeans are particularly fond of using that term. And then you press them and say, okay, so which shared values are you talking about? And what's the hierarchy of these values? You know, is the, the shared value of personal autonomy more important than the shared value of life and security. And they can't ever answer because <laughs> there isn't a shared value. I mean, different countries have fundamentally different values, or at least the emphasis is different, even within the democratic countries. Um, you go to Japan and it's, it's so much more communitarian. Uh, the idea that you have your right to free expression, well, that's important, but community and coherence and uh, um, calm, I guess the phrase is wa, W-A. That's, that's a value in Japan. And so I, 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 I love the phrase, the, the term values, I, I just don't see it being applied in a coherent way. And I, 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 I spent a lot of time with sociologists and anthropologists and they don't have any answers to these questions either. I, I don't know if we will ever agree on shared values. But I do think that respect for the truth and a desire to get more truthy, as a, as a physicist, I know that we never get absolute truth outside of the church, and that's a bad place to look for truth. Everything is always an approximation, and I, I, I think that's the thing we need to teach our kids, is that truth is very much a, something you approach asymptotically. You, you can get an extra significant digit you know you can get your your eighth digit your eighth decimal point but we know we know that we're never going to get the exact number and the exact truth about anything so anyway those are the reflections of a physicist not a philosopher and a, a policymaker not a sociologist but i i do wish we'd use these words in a more consistent way and it, it maybe we need different words I mean, maybe that we don't say truth. Maybe we do talk about. Um, I think. I, I think. Um, I'd be interested to know if anybody else had put another word out on the table uh, that that actually comes closer. Thank you very much. And again, I'm, I apologize for being late.
Um, Mike, thank you for joining. Usually you aren't able to join because you have overlapping calls. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, you're the first person to sort of put values into the conversation. So we haven't even, haven't, haven't even gotten there. And thank you also for reminding me about the word truthiness, which I think fits in here really nicely. Uh, and I, I got rid of the domain, but years ago, I, um, in, after talking with BJ Fogg uh, of uh, Captology, which is basically uh, how to uh, how to get people to change their minds. Um, I, I, I bought the domain truthinessinstitute.org. And I was going to invite a couple people to be like panelists or whatever uh, sages at the Truthiness Institute uh, so that they could point to stuff that was being floated that was like truthy, but not true or something. I don't remember exactly what the conversations were. But, but every time I talked with BJ, I was like, hey, BJ, use your powers for good. Remember the Spidey rule because because the stuff he was teaching and he he was sort of a student of, of uh, uh, Robert Cialdini and there's a whole there's a whole lineage here of people who know exactly how to get people to say yes when they mean when they mean to say no um, and that's dangerous knowledge right and and that's also how we manipulate truth in some sense we get people to to acquiesce or to join and uh, there have been a couple of really interesting book references put uh, in the chat uh, Gil is asking how many domains I own. I think the answer to that is too many. Uh, and I also have a, a, a several ironic. Um, so I own globalwarmingrealestate.com, where the top line says, hey, if you don't believe the science, maybe you see a business opportunity. Um, I own uh, penisinsurance.xyz, I think. Uh, which was after uh, a whole, after Dobbs lost, I was like, hey, man, you're going to have to buy insurance for this thing because it could go off at any time and, and we should make you liable just like we should make gun owners liable for owning guns. Um, and so I have a bunch of kind of ironic domains like that, which I haven't publicized very much or done, done much with. Um, Mr. Batello, you are next in my queue. Thank you, Jerry. I just want to dovetail on what uh, Mike was talking about. I, I think there's in precision, not just in the in the language of values, but also in virtues, and we mix those words up and we don't delineate them very well. And I'll just uh, say one thing and give one example, which is values divide us, virtues can align us. And you know, Jonathan Haig's book on the self righteous mind, you know, is a brilliant expose about the difference value systems between liberals and conservatives. We have the same values but we have differences and priorities that separate us out. And that's where hierarchical values uh, create so much of the friction. Whereas you, if you flip to a constellation of virtues and think, in, think of them in, in non-hierarchical ways, then you might be able to create some middle ground so you can navigate between our differences and value systems. So I think this, th this particular thing, that's why I would add virtues into the mix because I think you could do a deep dive into, into that. Thanks, Rick. Um, Mark, we're back to you. I think you wanted to jump in earlier, but thanks for your patience. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think of the other scientists who are much more into um, the notion of precision weighted prediction error as how the brain works with um, sensory information and intellectual information. So the brain and um, uh, uh, ATM, um, oh, what is it called? Um, automated temporal memory, um, different um, uh, studies of uh, artificial intelligence um, uh, engaging with the world. Basically say, you know, here's a sensation. Um, the brain is going to predict what the next sensation is. And by gauging the difference between the brain's prediction and the actual sensory input, it basically makes different kinds of adjustments in its future weighting and prediction. Um, it's an absolutely brilliant um, kind of foundation of how the brain works and how the brain works to novelty and why it treasures novelty. Um, so not only the mind, um, the brain. Um, I highly recommend the short abstract and the uh, link to the Surfing Uncertainty Prediction Action and the Embodied Mind by Andy Clark, who is one of my favorite um, philosopher scientists um uh it's pretty quick and easy to read um thanks thank you very much um lots and lots of sort of books and research references uh in this call um and, and 
I wish we could sort of summarize these for each other, give each other the TLDRs on many of these things because they they run so deep and they're so interconnected. Well, to your point, Jerry, I just posted something to the list because I can't uh, attach files here of uh, two pages of Jonathan Haidt's The Moral Foundations of Political Thought, one of which is a diagram, one of which is, explains each of the diagrams. So if you want to look at that, it's a kind of a very brief encapsulation of the righteous mind. Fabulous. Thank you. And I think that one slipped right past me. So, Well, it's, cool. it's one of the things that Haidt points out is that um, there are six values that uh, are common to both left and right, but the the, the people on the left tend to focus on uh, just a couple of them, and the people on the right focus on uh, the rest, and that's why they continually win in debates and they continually win elections, because they, uh, the left keeps focusing on care and harm and fairness, and the right, well, what about purity? What about loyalty and whatnot? So it's just, it's a really interesting view of um, the divisions that are going on in this country. So I'm just going to quote from my brain where I've taken some notes on the moral foundations theory. And there used to be five foundations of morality, and now there's six, is my understanding. <clears throat> and um, what I've got, let me just screen share for a sec. Uh, what I've got is this. So out of the righteous mind, uh, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, we go back to the five foundations <clears throat> of morality, authority, and respect fairness and reciprocity, harm and care, in-group and loyalty, purity and sanctity, and the sixth apparently is liberty. Uh, liberty and oppression is what uh, hate calls it. Okay, good. Let me just... Um, done. So he's got care, harm, fairness, cheating, liberty and oppression, which are what the left tends to focus on. Yeah. And sanctity and degradation, loyalty and betrayal, authority and subversion are what the right also, they, the right also talks about the, the three, but they also um, include those, which many people on the left do not. It's interesting to note that um, when Haight wrote the happiness hypothesis, he said, I really believed that uh, happiness came from within. And when I wrote The Righteous Mind, I shifted to believe that, the, that happiness comes from between. And he started out as a very left-leaning liberal. And after studying uh, the conservative movements and what was going on, he said, I'm actually now much more moderate. Um, I, I came to believe they have a lot of really good points that get <clears throat> lost in the, in the shuffle and in the, in the debates. And um, he's quite shifted his political stance quite a bit from writing, researching and writing that book. It's really interesting how um, point of view equals ADIQ points. Like, like that's Alan Kay's quote from way back when. And I just, it's one of my favorite quotes entirely because we're all sort of looking at the same data, the same stuff, the same media, the same things that flow by in the info torrent. Although uh, I'll, I'll get the exact quote from my brain. Um, I think it's point of view equals 80 IQ points and I'm pretty sure it's 80. There we go. Uh, and I'll put the quote investigator page for it in. <clears throat> And um, what it, so we're all kind of looking at the same morass of, of information and we're reading it in different ways. And uh, but then there's all these human fallacies and biases and perceptual problems that come in there, which is um, people will disconfirm or disbelieve things that disagree with their mental model, their point of view. Um, so, so evidence that is perfectly satisfying to other people won't even make it onto the radar of people who you know don't believe something happens to be True, I'll use the word here just because it's so fun in this conversation. Um, and so trying to figure out, um, so uh, the, the talk I gave just recently in Bucharest um, was a talk explaining how I came up with my point of view for the talk I gave two years earlier, virtually for the same conference about how trust is the only way forward. And so that's that's sort of my thesis on trust and a whole bunch of other things. Well, like, how did that show up? And so I tell that story, and I'll put I'll put a link to the Bucharest talk uh, in the chat. But I tell that story because I feel like my point of view and what triggered this was talking about uh, Democrats and Republicans and and so forth is or liberal sorry liberalism and conservatism, which we were just doing, um, is that I realized that both liberals and conservatives were like trying to install a, a male dominated mechanistic universe where where large institutions took over responsibility for things that humans should have responsibility for doing blah 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 um and and um 
and that folded into a bunch of other sort of ideas about how how the world works um, that are maybe dimensionally a little bit different. I don't know exactly what, but <clears throat> too many things to sort of drop into the conversation all at once here. But it makes me realize that many people's truths are very contingent on their framing, their worldview, which means their community, their society, uh, their neighbors, uh, because these things run uh, across social groups. Uh, we, we will hold truths within our social group also because the danger of ostracism is much greater than the danger of being caught in a lie or, or some, some inconvenient incongruity. Like, like you, ostracism is really bad for humans. Humans do not like ostracism. It's right up there, you know, just after death uh, and things like that. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Mark Kranza. Yeah, um, just as a virtual uh, uh, facilitator, um, I'll just note, um, seeing things in the chat, but haven't heard from Patty or Hank yet. Um, I think maybe Carl. Yeah, yeah, I think we've heard from Carl. Just, um, uh, just checking in to uh, encourage... Uh, if there's anything to contribute, um, not a, not a demand. Thanks, Mark. And and I sometimes use the facilitators trick of anybody who's been speaking, please step back, and whoever would else would like to jump forward. But let's let's do that for a moment. And um, anybody who's been busy, go quiet. And anybody else, step in. Well, I put uh, a couple of things in the in the chat earlier about uh, not only absolute or sub subjective truths, but also suggested, suggestive and uh, uh, seductive truths. And uh, I think there's a lot of different categories or or domains, uh, uh, as was put earlier, that we can uh, put truths into. And uh, I think it's really a matter of uh, what works for individuals and the groups they're in. I definitely agree with what you said, Jerry, about uh, the awfulness of ostracism and people will do anything to remain in a group. Uh, about the comment of uh, how many uh, million or billion people we don't believe would be wrong, but we see it uh, every day in uh, so-called uh, uh, false democracies uh, uh, where people like uh, Orban or or Trump get uh, or Boris Johnson get elected by millions of people who don't believe that what's being said uh, matters, whether it's true or not, but it fits their version of reality they can want to live with. And I put with a misspelling earlier in the chat as well, uh, the example of the Truman Show. I mean, what's really true and what makes you happy? So, I mean, a lot of things I can comment on, but I'm really enjoying listening to the rest. Thanks, Hank. Anyone else who hasn't um, jumped in yet? I, uh, Mark, I appreciate you presenting I'm presenting that and I would love to I actually pop something in the chat it was right before um, you popped out of the room it was uh, I think I just asked if you could share the name of that um, abstract you had brought into conversation and the author um, I would love to take a look at that otherwise I don't know that I really have anything to add I'm just enjoying listening thank you for following up on that Patty I had the same question and it flo it floated by in the in the info flood um could could you repeat the re wanted reference Jerry, I, I don't know that I would be able to do much more than what I just did. You mentioned a summary article about the hates hate, I think, wrote a summary article about Andy Clark's book or something like that. I think that's the right order, but I'm not sure. I, I think Ken else? Sent, it, sent it to the email list rather than putting it in the chat. Ah, <clears throat> I, I can't put files into the chat i'm not it's restricted so um i think you just might need to reboot your zoom because it's not restricted at all really let me see oh oh i'm sorry you're trying to share a file yeah no, i always have trouble sharing files in in, in zoom yeah. sorry. when i click on it, it says access to file restricted by your account admin so gotcha uh, so uh, I, I emailed it to the list it's just it's two pages i i drew a diagram and then i just copied his each one of the care harm, each one of the foundations. So it's really quick to read and it gives a very quick summary of, of the main points in his book. And Patty, I think you're on the OGM list. Cool. 
So it's there. Awesome. Anybody else want to jump in? I, yeah, actually something came up. I, um, I think what, what's coming up for me as I'm present for this, uh, this part of the conversation is just this, uh, feels like curiosity around how advisable it is for certain, and I know we can't dictate who uses language and how they use it, but um, you know, the, the potential power and, and harm of um, words that are used really frequently and freely, I think, and without perhaps much, much thought. Um, truth, I think, could, could be one of those words. I think it's something, a word that is used with a lot of conviction often without a yeah, maybe much, much thought or intention. And um, so to maybe just a larger curiosity around language use and the advisability of um, word choice, I guess, and, and certain words being being used without thought and how um, potentially harmful and dangerous that is. That's just something through my lens. I'm very curious about language and language use. So I think that's what's coming up for me in this conversation. Thanks, Patty. Me too. Um, and in particular, politically, there's an awful lot of that going on. Uh, right at this moment. It's, it's a very hot topic, um, both from identity politics and political correctness, uh, which is the right argument against the left in some sense, and then in uh, other ways of sort of loaded terms and uh, other kinds of things that are lighting fires all over the place. So I think this is a, and and I think if, I, would, I think one of the domains in which open global mind has a lot of care and we haven't done that much but it is politics and and sort of active philosophical political discourse because we would like people to be able to figure their way out to collaborate together to to basically try to fix things instead of just being in log in the log jams that we're in uh so often um and 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 also we we have a and we've created or we're living inside of a culture where we have kind of a vendetta mentality instead of it's the calling out versus calling in is the way I like to think of this trope. And there've been a couple of good talks that, I, that I've added to my brain about, hey, hey, in a healthy society, you don't behead the person who did something wrong and salt the earth they stood on. You actually try to figure out how to bring them back in to be a good participant in society. That's like what a healthy group ought to do. Uh, and we're not doing that. We, we, and then once you're busy beheading people for doing anything wrong, then you get all, all sorts of people who don't want to raise their hand uh, and call out something that happened that might have been wrong because the the, the axe is a little too close by. Um, and you, that just spirals downward very quickly. So how do we get a society where um, we're saying something, it's restorative justice, as Stacey just wrote into the chat, exactly, uh, as opposed to retributive justice, which is what we have now, or um, proud justice, which is sort of what we have now. Like retributive justice even means you got inside the the, the, the justice system. Uh, Mark, then Patty. Hmm. Um, I think I mentioned this last <clears throat> week, but, um, been hanging out with uh, Catholic philosophers at um, oh, lyceum.institute. And um, Mark, you've gone mute on me. Anybody else hearing him? Uh, we cannot hear you. You're not muted in Zoom. You're muted some other way. Not hearing you yet. It could be an electromagnetic pulse has just gone through the Bay Area, but I don't think so. I think it's his internet. Now it's uh, crackly, but coming back. Sure. Oh, there we go. Oh wow! Now everything is crackling. Your now your video image is crackling. Oh, this is really fun. I'm totally enjoying whatever it is you're doing or whatever's happening. Yeah, he's signal. he's messing with us. Yeah, yeah. Interpretive dance. We want to see interpretive dance. And in the chat, he wrote, "Please move on." Yeah. But that was just so entertaining. Mark, thank you so much for the the intermission entertainment there. Um, Patty, floor is yours. Uh, and you're muted. Thanks. Just circling back around to what you were saying, Jerry, around, you didn't call it cancel culture, but I'm, I'm understanding what you're talking about to be cancel culture. I was thinking about that yesterday and how it occurred to me, you know, I'm, I'm present with the, the um, 
punitive justice versus more of the Ubuntu approach to bringing in, you know, bringing in those who may have wandered, lost their way and bring them back into the tribe to, you know, bring them home to themselves. I'm familiar with that, but I think it occurred to me yesterday that um, it also kind of feels like a, a, a bypassing of sorts, almost, you know, when someone, you know, the, the axe falls on someone's head for saying something that was, you know, whatever it was. Um, and it, it almost kind of seems in my mind also like, just an, an inability or unwillingness to engage with what is often like the nuance of of what is actually happening in that and you know really moving it quickly into black and white right or wrong just kind of yesterday it occurred to me like hmm, that just kind of feels like perhaps a reflection of our collective <clears throat> or who's ever making these decisions the ability or willingness to engage at a deeper level of emotional inquiry and just wanting to understand empathy that occurred to me yesterday I wanted to presence that um thank you and I, I it seems that nuance is out like like um it's hard to slow things down and say yo yo hey hey wait a minute that assertion you just made is not actually accurate because this 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 and there's there's no room or patience for the detail um which might be mitigating and might not it might it might explain really well why somebody did something so so we're we're in a very uncivil this is my my own this is my truth of the situation is that we're in a and i and i don't mind the the the, the, the phrase my truth because it, i'm stating just the conclusion of my perceptions and sort of scratching my head about this um and probably i should substitute the word truth in there with my perception of the of what's happening or something like that or, or my conclusions are but we're in a, an extremely uncivil era and we have a super conducting public square uh, which is owned by companies whose re reward system is all about addicting us to the platform, or in this case, just not even minding who the hell shows up and what's being said on the platform, which is what Musk seems to be doing to Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in that sphere, in this epoch, how do we make our way back to civil discourse and calling in culture and a bunch of other things that healthy communities would do? Because it feels like the space we're in and the community the, the the community interactions we're having are in in many in many cases very uncivil and un, unhealthy for humans uh, does anybody agree disagree with that i agree with that and I, I think one of the ways we get back to a healthy community is to ask people what do you think makes a healthy community and to listen to every single voice including the ones who have traditionally been marginalized and i'm including the community because they've got an awful lot to contribute yep yep Absolutely. Stacey. Yeah, to add on to what Ken's saying, um, one of the things that I've been saying is that when I just observe, it seems like there's a lack of curiosity. And I think that that, you know, ties into what Ken's saying is that curiosity should be where we start from. Um, love that. Totally agree. Klaus? Yeah, Ken just triggered something uh, that that's really close to what I'm working on when you're saying community and paying attention to everybody in the community. Um, so many of the solutions, I mean, right now we are really in a very transformative stage because there are billions of dollars being invested uh, in the energy systems and food systems and so on. And the challenge is that uh, it has to engage everyone in the population Right. So, but the the solutions that are that are funded are top down, you know, and not bear in mind the uniqueness that you find in individual communities, socioeconomic issues, climate issues, you know, um, ability access to water. Water is a huge determinant on what communities can and cannot do, and so there 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 is there is just no focus really on being inclusive to these marginalized groups because it takes a lot of work. It's counterintuitive to the way businesses operate. So the, 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 there is an uh, Egyptian uh, professor who wrote a paper on the base of pyramid economy or the, the you know, base, of, yeah, base of pyramid economy arguing that you really need a non-profit mindset to deal directly with these marginalized communities but then 
and and that businesses should work through these nonprofits in order to really function because they don't understand and they are incapable really to deal with this part of the market but we i mean i mean the the the, the most important part in my mind really is to avoid people becoming desperate right because desperate people do desperate things and um looking you know as we as we transition here into changing the economy in very foundational ways we still we still don't have a formula that uh, that um assures this kind of inclusivity that that ken was just referring to it is the most worrisome thing in my mind were you thinking of ck prahalad thinking I, I didn't hear you Klaus was the the writer you were talking about earlier, uh, C.K. Prahalad, who I think is Indian, not Egyptian, but is that the right guy, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid guy? I post the article. Let me find. Good. It. And Ken Ken just posted an article by Prahalad in the chat, which is why I'm asking as well. Um, Patty, please. Yeah, Jerry, going back around to what you were asking earlier around, you know, nuances out and how do we how do we begin to address um, building these bridges in the current you know state of things? I wonder how much. Um, the uh, inability to hold space for nuance or complexity or curiosity, as Stacey was saying, might be a reflection of nervous system dysregulation and, you know, just just the product of a lot of a lot of bodies in survival mode. Right. I think even if if the media hadn't had a part in post COVID, I think it would have already done it for a lot of people. But I think the media cycle is, this is my opinion, media cycle is is having um, a, a big say or a, a helping hand in further just the, perpetuating the cycle of dysregulation on an individual level. And so maybe the question I'm I'm asking is how how does that get addressed on a on a wider level, especially when the and, and this is my understanding of of the thing, the act of engaging in things that are dysregulating actually feels like good and it feels like it's scratching an itch and it can it can feel comfortable and like the new comfortable to the nervous system in in the dysregulated system. Curious what other people's thoughts are around this. Thanks, Patty. And in in Situations like that, we will seek comfort wherever we can, and often those relationships that end up are pretty tangled and dysfunctional, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Kim? With regard to bottom of the pyramid, I was in a, I don't know where I was, I was in some some online course, and, and people were talking about this, and they said, you know, um, they're actually up to 3.0 now. The CK Prahalad put out the base of the pyramid back in the early 2000s, and um, there have been some uh, philanthropists and and educational organizations studying this, and they discovered, related to community, that when they went into um, a very poor community and they gave somebody a pig or a cow or a bicycle or something that would, you know, very minor investment that would help them to um, uh, grow financially, they immediately discovered they ran into something that's very common to human beings. As soon as that family began to do well, they went, oh, we're better than the rest of you, and we're not going to, you know, so what they're doing now is they try to invest in the entire community rather than the individual family in order to spread the wealth around because if it's concentrated in one family that family is going to see themselves as better than and they it undoes all of the good that they're attempting to do so i think we also have to be really aware of human proclivities you know i mean it's natural to when you start to do well you're like oh i'm better than you and you know it, it's we have to keep thinking on these really basic levels of what are, to Patty's point, you know, not just dysregulated uh, nervous systems, but also the the appeal of being better than someone else. You know, so many people get their self worth from comparing themselves to others rather than comparing themselves to who they want to be or how how they used to be. It's fascinating to me how difficult it is to try to improve the world. Hmm. And how often, how little it pays back, and I don't mean monetarily. Um, I'm not that fond of Bill Gates's decisions, but certainly he has poured a whole bunch of money he made in ways I question uh, into vaccines and a bunch of other health issues, where the interventions in retrospect might in fact not have been the best interventions he could have done. And never mind that there's a whole conspiracy theory that he's implanting chips in people through the vaccines, through the you know COVID vaccines and all that kind of stuff. Never, never mind that layer of it. <clears throat> but but I'm thinking of other people who 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 tried hard to 
make things better and it doesn't uh, doesn't often go well i'm i'm thinking of john Kerry, who ran for president and was a vietnam war hero uh, three words that make me cringe and then came back and was a hero because he went into congress and testified and said this war is should not be happening so so twice a hero in different kinds of ways and then was very effectively disabled by the kinds of mechanisms we're talking about today with uh, swift boating and other sorts of things that that were about disinformation and the undermining of truth in the political marketplace on purpose as strategy. And that that's one of the cynical stories that that I look back to and think, well, crap, that that's the world we're living in today. That's the world that gives us our leaders. Um, Gil, Patty, Mark. Um, John Kerry also became Secretary of State very effectively and a remarkable global advocate for climate. Uh, and so I would just note that you saying, Jerry, that it, that change is hard uh, isn't in the domain of truth that we started the conversation in. It's in the oh, domain you, of truth. You, you think it's not hard? Well, it's it is it, definitely my truth. It's my opinion. It, but it's yeah. in it, yeah, it's in it's it's an interpretation, which is what we do. Yeah. Uh, other people are thrilled by challenges. Other people look at the world and say, full of opportunity, look at all this change that's happening. Uh, some people say it's climate doom, and some people say the momentum is accelerating and, you know, and moving power. This is the realm of interpretation. And I don't say that to be critical, but just to note that, Ken, when you talked about the, you know, the human nature of superiority over others, that's, I, I suspect that that's cultural. Uh, and that that shows up different in different worlds. And in the case of of, uh, of India and bottom of the pyramid, in the early days of Grameen Bank, uh, they made their loans to groups of women in a village together uh, uh, so that there can be mutual support uh, and mutual encouragement, if you will, social pressure to repay loans and to support each other in repay loans. It was specifically designed not to atomize and self-maximize, but to build solidarity and support which I will argue is as innately human, if anything is innately human as the other. So I just wanna be really careful when we say people are like this, because what I see is an infinite variety of how people are. And what the, you know, the Graeber Wengro book, The Dawn of Everything argues, and I think pretty well supports is that that infinite variety has been there throughout our entire, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of existence on this planet. And for me, that's cause for enormous uh, uh, peace of mind and optimism. So there's my, I'm not going to call it my truth, because I don't feel that level of certainty about it, but it's my orientation and how I navigate this mess that we're in right now um, on, a, on, on a good day. Yeah, thanks, Gil. Thanks for bringing that yeah. up. I'll, I'll take a yeah. little piece of that and riff on it for a sec, which is um, the argument that uh, Graeber and Wenger are trying to make is that, hey, human life way back when wasn't nasty, brutish, and short. Agriculture didn't civilize and save the world. There are all these other subtleties, and he, we humans had way richer repertory of ways that they stayed alive and ways that they did mm -hmm. things, which is really cool. And I think a piece of what we're suffering from, from, our, from the conventional wisdom of history that they're trying to duel with, is that people tried to narrow down those things into some sort of set truths about history, yeah. which are then yeah. useful for their political or sociological or other kinds of projects, right? Uh, if if life is nasty, brutish, and short, and people people are generally selfish and cruel, then we need my prison system, and we need my punitive system, mm -hmm. and we need my mm -hmm. whatever else because that's how we build arguments, right? Mm -hmm. And so 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 much of this is all just intertwined. Um, Patty. Yeah, sorry, really appreciate um, uh, Ken and especially Gil's Gil sharing um, took me in a really interesting direction with what I was planning on on presencing, which was that per per Ken's um, suggestion of just just maybe having wisdom and being aware of the you know human proclivities. I think what I was hearing and Ken sharing was the um, uh, and perhaps it is mm. this culture deep prevalence of shame. You know, I, I think that I I understand self righteousness to to be an offshoot, to be um, an expression, a manifestation of deep shame, right? And then when Gil said, you know, offered or, you know, um, invited us to consider that, hey, maybe that's just this culture. I've never left. Um, I've never been to another country. So I only know I only know and have experienced this culture. So acknowledging that. Um, but then I'm thinking like, oh, man, that wouldn't surprise me uh, for, for that for that to be close, because, you know, to to my awareness, American culture is uh, um, the 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 country most steeped in the traditions of Christianity. Does that does that track? Is that? Or we, we have no nope, mm -hmm. gills. No, nope, that's not that's not it. Um, or we have um, 
I guess I just assumed that we had really strong Christian um, or um, a framework of, you know, good, bad, right, and wrong. And I, you know, my experience in the Catholic church was, was a deep um, experience of, I think, you know, like humans are flawed, cast out from the garden. There, there's, I think, shame built into the contract of, let's say, just Catholic religion. That's just been my experience. Others might feel differently about that. But I yeah, think pa pa Patty, uh, the United States is is probably the bastion of, evan of evangelical Christianity. Mm. Uh, but the Christian world includes Europe and 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 sure. the entire Americas, mm -hmm. uh, sure. as well as a lot of others. I mean, what you know, was it more than a billion or a billion and a half Christians in the world? So, among Thank you. and 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 among developed nations, America is unusually religious. Yeah, but that's the, what. But the, but the great yeah. vast, yeah. but the but yeah. the growth markets for Christianity, in particular Catholicism, are South America, uh, Latin America, and Africa. I mean, th th mm -hmm. those are just giant growth markets. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, 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 I'm, I'm realizing that I misspoke there, really just, just trying to acknowledge that there seems to be, in, in maybe relation to other countries, an, an especially strong presence of, you know, guild named an evangelical Christian theology. And, you know, that, that's not something I'm well versed in, but I think this also brings up for me, um, the I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, David Hawkins' Power Versus Force. He, he brings up this, um, this really interesting idea of their, kind of going back to what Jerry was saying, you know, it, it's just feeling really difficult to change the world and then this needle can feel difficult to move. Uh, when it's, you know, this is my internalizing Jerry, what you said, when it's, you know, tilted so far in one direction, David Hawkins suggests that there is, um, I, my word for it is like an emotional physics at play, right? That, that there's actually um, uh, power and, um, you know, do degrees of, I, I, my belief is that there's actually something happening in the physics um, realm when the experience of emotion, and I'm curious how much that is at play with how difficult it is to, to, as we say, move the needle. David Hawkins suggests that things like the emotion of shame, the experience of shame on this progression of the um, uh, energetic, I think he describes it as energetic power or uh, the quality of, of each of the, you know, more prominent emotions, shame registers as one of the lowest and the one closest to the experience of death. And, and it's, its power is um, exponentially... It's, it's, it's very strong. It's a very hard expression to move and, and to change. And so anyway, I, I don't know how I feel about the how he arrived to those conclusions in his book and how, how he arrived at those measurements, but it's just an interesting concept. And that's what's coming up for me in this conversation. Um, Patty, thank you for that very much. And anything you can pass to us through the chat or the mailing list that'll route us back toward emotional physics and learning more about it, I would, we would appreciate a lot. That's um, just, that, that's just my, my, I haven't heard that before. That's just my, my name for it. That's just how okay. I'm internalizing it, but I'll share the book. We can put a trademark after it and like drop it in the world with you. Um, <laughs> and then you made me think kind of, of, of the opposite a little bit, because shame is very much a, a tool, but right now, like one of my lessons from one of my truths from the, the Trumpocalypse is that shamelessness is an awesome political tool that anything you say three times is true, is the Bellman's fallacy. And so th through mere repetition, you can cause things to come into being. But if you say things with no shame about how bald face a lie it is, like if yesterday you said that the moon was in the, in the sky and today you say it's the sun, if you don't have any shame about it, the system isn't strong enough to actually correct that. The system isn't strong enough to correct a bunch of people repeating lies. Um, and I think I, we haven't talked so much about lying, but I guess um, some part of the opposite of truth is lies. Um, but but it, it seems like understanding that and then just doing that and repeating it is uh, an active tactic in the world. So there we go. Uh, Judy and Mark. Uh, you're muted, Judy. Sorry, I do that for background. Um, I just wanted to interject into the conversation the concept of interpersonal energy transfer, which is a physical concept that's been measured. There are energy domains that humans give off in other species and they interact with one another. So crowd following isn't just that you're listening to words and being influenced by words, you're actually picking up the energy, the emotion, etc., of the people around you. And that's a dimension that we tend to neglect, but it's very powerful in terms of what engages people in their actions, thoughts, and behaviors. And so that might be something for us to dive into at another time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark. 
on that the uh, madness of crowds and the wisdom of crowds um when i was young i would go with my dad um like young meaning like 12 to 16 to um motivational seminars um and i would watch you know a very charismatic and anybody can be charismatic if you paid a thousand dollars an hour uh to be so um hmm. basically this crowd would be an emotional chain reaction everybody would kind of like a little bit amp amplify and that amplification would spread around they get a little bit amplified and um yeah uh, crowds can go nuts um what i was attempting to say before when i guess my computer had uh ran out of resources and battery power um was um I hang out with a number of uh, Catholic philosophers um, at uh, Lyceum.Institute. And uh, the point was made, I thought I brought it up uh, last week, that um, shame in Catholicism is a regulatory mechanism, uh, not always a punishment mechanism. And that in, you know, there's Catholicism is wide and deep. So there's, you know, all kinds of, um retribution as well as and you know horrible massacres as well as you know feed the poor um as you know one of the centers of uh you know the epiphany ceremony i went to um but um the mention was you know the me too and the woke movement doesn't have a developed um penance forgiveness um uh you know the kinds of things you know you go to confession your sins are forgiven go in peace um kind of you know stability of yeah you're healed please you know try try again do better um you know the community is with you and, and supports you in you know recognizing your mistake and helping you to rejoin the community anyway um, um thanks for so more Mark, isn't calling in, I just typed it in the chat, a form of forgiveness and confession? Isn't that, I mean, that's sort of what I intended when I was describing the difference between call out and call in culture is that in a healthy community, that with the process you just described, which is sort of ritualized in Catholicism in certain ways, is that. And, and it strikes me also that confession is this private thing between you and one priest in a booth under the white rose, which is the Virgin Mary's symbol. That's why it's called sub rosa. That's why these mm. conversations are secret. That's the, that's the etymology of sub rosa. Um, mm. um, and, yeah. and why is that? Why is this not a more public confession of what happened, like in a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Witnessing. Um, basically, there's um, any number of... Um, uh, group kinds of um, situations where, um, you know, say even AA, where it's like, you know, right. my name's Mark, and I'm a, I'm a reader. Hi, Mark. You know, <laughs> I'm addicted to, uh, I'm addicted to prints. Um, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Like the, these book things, they're just like yeah. a pain, aren't they? The early years of English literature. Oh, sweet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I will, I will confess. Um, uh, today, um, three minutes ago, is the first time I've ever heard of something in. I'm sorry, what was it? Call, calling in. Calling in. Yeah, I've I've never never heard that before. Um, just now. Thanks. I will uh, put a link to calling in in my brain in the chat right now uh, if you want to go explore. Uh, Judy, then Michael. Judy, is your hand up from before? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it down. Okay, thanks. Dr. Grossman. Hi, all. Uh, I, too, am a print addict. My name is Michael. Hi, Michael. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll have to form our, our own separate uh, confession group um mark um and anybody else who wants to join i just wanted to to throw out um something on regarding shame that i don't know what to do with but seems to to bear some conversation is i feel like shame has gone from uh a thing that an individual feels and either holds and deals with the ramifications of that um, or 
confesses to lift the burden or you know does does whatever have has whatever strange reactions they do to it to something that is much more prevalently um asked of others the shaming of others that you should feel shame about something that you don't feel shame about working in both directions politically you know as as part of outrage culture um can you believe that this person is shamelessly doing this terrible thing um and the person themselves doesn't think they're doing something shameful uh and you know offers their lack of shame in in reaction but that that shame is has become something of a an artificial weapon um wielded by those who want to shame i mean not that shaming didn't go on in the past you know in in great measure but now it really is more often um called upon in reference to the other than um than people publicly offering their confessions of actual shame the you know donald trump's never apologized being being the model um but you know constant shaming of others um anyway just wanted to share that for discussion thank you um let's go into we're late into the call we're almost at the end but let's sort of go into silence for just a little bit to process that was a lot of stuff and then i'll, I'll bring us back out in a sec Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wrote George Santos into the chat huh. because I had a little light bulb go on in my head a couple of days ago that I know, Ken. <laughs> um, I had a little light bulb go off in my head that for some people on the alt-right, George Santos is a hero and a role model because look, you can lie about freaking everything and become a congressman and get to vote on stuff. And the fact that he continues <clears throat> to pour like shit into the world with lies is merely proof that it's impossible to remove somebody like that. Like it hasn't happened yet and might, but might not. Don't know. Don't know how this exactly goes. But but it, I realized that that this is a, it may just be that he's a, a compulsive liar, but it may also be that this is just a, a, a modern successful political tactic and that he is its fullest modern expression in the American political arena with, with lots of success. Uh, yeah, exactly, Santos in West Wing. Um, and so that scares me because, because we're, we're sort of in those waters. That, that seems to be kind of where we are uh, socially. And I don't think that that goes away. Oh, the other thing I want to say about Santos is very much like Trump, the more attention that he gets so we think that i think the press may think that oh my gosh rubbing this in his face and shaming him is just going to get rid of him and make him go away and it's like uh actually might be might be the opposite it might be that this is a fabulous way to own the media cycle and one of the things that trump understood that nobody else seemed to understand was that Trump didn't care if everybody was saying negative stuff about him. Owning the media cycle was the only thing he cared about and the victory. And if he could have a debate, uh, and I've said this a couple of, a, a long ago on OGM calls, I said, Trump understood that he could not survive a normal debate with any smart person. Like he was not going to win an actual debate. So he had to undermine every debate so that the three days after each debate, uh, the whole conversation was only about him and not about how the other person won the debate or blah, 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 none of that, none of that, which meant he always had to escalate a little bit, but never so much that he would be thrown off the rails. 
And then I'll just I'll just throw in the little fact that, you know, eight years of Obama and the biggest controversy is he wears a light gray suit one day and and Trump on any one day would do 10, 15, 30 things that were far more egregious and get away with them and still be a, a viable contender right now for the next electoral cycle. That's amazing. And that that's and that's commentary to me on how far truthiness has slipped from being a funny thing that Colbert uh, uh, leveraged to being fundamental to the electoral, political, emotional cycle right now. And that frightens me very deeply. Was it beige? I thought it was tan. I mean, I thought it was light gray. Well, uh, tan, was, tan or beige, it was, you know. Just... Well, if it was beige, that was clearly a criminal offense. I mean, Absolutely. God. I'm amazed he didn't get impeached. Exactly. <laughs> um, Michael, I think you still have your hand up from earlier. So I will go to Patty. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know that there's any way to, to, to track this, but it, um, what comes up for me is this curiosity around there. I wonder if there's a correlation between um, a sense of maybe our, our relationship with truth and um, our relationship with a, our own like felt embodied sense of personal power or lack thereof, right? And I wonder if, if there's some, I don't know how the two would be related, but I sense that they might be related. Don't know how to name it though. Um, and I think people, so part of my, part of my trope on where we are right now is that people are feeling very powerless, that there's a, there's a few people who are feeling, feeling quite a bit of power because they're managing to move public opinion and do whatever else, but there's a whole bunch of humans who feel disaffected, alienated, powerless in the face of mega crises, poly crises now, that's the word of the year, right? Um, and so I, I think very much so. And and our hunt for truth and certainty in the middle of powerlessness is is why this dynamic feels maybe so hard. <clears throat> um, something like does that ring for you, Patty, or is, would you explain it differently? I don't know that I would explain it differently. Yeah, that that resonates. Thanks for speaking to that. Thanks, um, Gil. And then uh, Ken has a poem for us on the way out. <clears throat> powerlessness is something that we're sold. Powerlessness is part of the game and part of the strategy to persuade us that we're powerless and to persuade us that we're empty and to encourage us to go buy shit and not organize to change things and take power. And I would strongly recommend that people take a look at Anand Giraharidas's new book, Persuasion. Uh, there's a bunch of interviews of him on, on, on the tubes about that. And what he's basically arguing is is the hell with this powerlessness story and the hell with its human nature this way or that way. It's time to just like, you know, strap in and outcompete these folks and do a better job of selling a better story. Uh, and there's a lot of successes in the last election cycle, as well as in many other places around the world. And he's basically saying, quit whining and get to work uh, eloquently um, uh, with stories and examples. And it's uh, the book is called Persuasion. It's actually called The uh, Persuaders. I put the full title the in. The Persuaders. Chat. Thank you. Even better. Um, and it's about that. There you go. Uh, really juicy, interesting. Start with a couple of the recent videos and the book if you want. But it's a, it sets a very different mood for this story. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to feel despair in times like these, which is, you know, it's an interpretation of how to, how to live in the world. But it's really worth remembering that they are pumping despair at us. Yes. Uh, in whose interest is it for us to feel despair? It's a version of the follow the money story, right? Yep. In whose interest? Who wants you to feel that way? It's funny because if we were, if, if, if muggles, if civilians, if citizens were intelligent, trustworthy, connected, and actively working to make their lives better, a lot of the political crap wouldn't work. It would, That's go, right. it would have to go away. And so it doesn't, I'm sorry to be so cynical, but it doesn't behoove anybody to have us be those things. That's right. Well, it, well, it's not that it doesn't behoove anybody. So the question is, who does it behoove? Those are possible allies. Uh, Michael, you're back on the queue, so I assume you want to jump back in. Yeah, I just wanted to add to um, what what Gil and some others have been saying and weave it back to the sort of projected shame thing um, and the negativity that is the most effective 
unfortunately, and I, I wonder, I'm, I'm curious about how um, the persuaders deals with this. Politicians and public figures have seen that the negative about the other is more powerful than the positive about themselves or, you know, proclaiming a vision. It's more the scare of the terrible, shameful, right. awful stuff that the other wants to do. Um, yeah, just that. Uh, I, 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 you know, that advantage is unfortunately whoever is putting that out in effect. It's, it's you know, sort of been proven um, in our society, you know, at, at the current time. And, and it feels like that's a time honored, underhanded political thing that dates back as far as we can sort of read in some sense. Um, I guess. Uh, Stacy, <clears throat> I think you'll have the last word here, and then we might have two poems. We have, I think Ken and uh, Mark both have poems. So Stacy, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say two simple things about shame. One is that what I've observed and witnessed and spoken to people, the best ways to get rid of shame seem to be in those small groups of trusted people doing it together where you have the same components that you have in restorative justice, which is sort of a community, hearing different sides, empathizing, and you have those safety factors built in because you know your love, just like, uh, you know, Patty mentioned the Ubuntu way. It's the same, you know, principle. I've been calling it pre-storative justice because I want to see systems that build those into the way we do things. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is going back to politics, I think that we make a big mistake by not separating the deed from the person. So as much as we might really be mad at George Santos, by, folk, by trying to shame him, that's not helping us. Where we should be shaming it, who are the people that would support a liar? How foolish are they to think he won't lie about something else? But what I'm trying to say is not to direct shame at a person, but to direct shame at an act, because too many people are incapable of seeing situations objectively, depending on who's involved. So if we can remove the person from the situation and just talk about the situation, I think that would be in our best interest. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, you're reminding me by coining pre of justice that years ago I met, I think it's this woman in my brain, Ruth Morris, who created something called transformative justice. And she had a really interesting critique of restorative justice. And the, the I think if memory serves, the process of transformative justice involved looking up at the system to figure out what 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 were the problems in the system that caused the situation we're busy trying to remedy and making some effort to reach up and correct the system as well, uh, insofar I, as it could be done. If I could just add quickly yeah. and look at what are the things that work, because I feel like a lot of times we forget to take those things that are actually working. So I'm making YouTube shorts about what works to revitalize cities right now. Uh, there, it was a little feature in Pete's Plex. Anybody who'd like to do those things and like pass them in, let me know. I'll, I'll link to them and add them. Um, because I think we need to, uh, Stacey, to what you just said, we need a lot of stories in the world of what's working in every domain because people don't know. People don't have time to, to waste like going and finding stuff. They don't hear, the, like there's a lot of good being shared and the medium for sharing stuff is now just as free as the medium for destroying the world. <clears throat> so why don't we just share the good stuff? Um, Gil, we will talk about that. Um, Mark, you have a poem for us and I think that will wrap our, our call today. And uh, Ken had to leave, so I'm sorry I messed that up. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'd like to highlight the work of Marion Moore, a uh, New England poet, um, 1887 to 1972. Um, brilliant wry moralist. And um, this is medium length. I'll try to read it quickly and clearly. You do not seem to realize that beauty is a liability rather than an asset. That in view of the fact that spirit creates form, we are justified in supposing that you must have brains. For you, 
a symbol of the unit, stiff and sharp, conscious of surpassing by dint of native superiority, and liking for everything self-dependent, anything an ambitious civilization might produce for you, unaided to attempt through sheer reserve to confute presumptions resulting from observation is idle. You cannot make us think you a delightful happen so. But Rose, if you are brilliant, it is not because your petals are the without which nothing of preeminence. You would look, minus thorns, like a what is this? A mere peculiarity. They are not proof against a worm, the elements or mildew, but what about the predatory hand? What is brilliance without coordination? You would look, I'm sorry, what uh, guarding the infinitesimal pieces of your mind, compelling audience to the remark that it is better to be forgotten than to be remembered too violently. Your thorns are the best part of you. Roses only, Marion Moore. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate that. Thanks, everybody. Lovely being here with you. Thanks for speaking your truths <laughs> together. There you go again. Thanks, Jerry. Week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.